This Filmmaker IQ lesson is sponsored by ICANN, award-winning designer, manufacturer, and distributor of professional video, film, and broadcast production equipment. And by Blackmagic Design, creating the world's highest quality solutions for feature film, post-production, and television broadcast industries. Welcome to FilmmakerIQ.com. I'm John Hess and today we'll look at the story of Hollywood censorship and the journey that brought us to the movie rating system we have today. Cinema is an art form born of the Industrial Revolution, a form of entertainment made possible by advancements in chemistry and mass production. Now, this is also a time of social progressivism, a movement in the United States and elsewhere in the late 19th and early 20th century that sought to bring about positive social change through active social organization and government regulation. In 1897, Maine passed the first censorship law regarding films over the sensitive subject of boxing. A prize fighting was an extraordinarily popular sport, but it was technically illegal in all but one state, Nevada. Now, on March 17, 1897, the fight of the century occurred between James Colbert and Bob Fitzsimmons in Carson, Nevada. The contest was captured on film by Enoch J. Rector on over 11,000 feet of widescreen film, becoming the longest and most important film ever made at the time. Even though states had anti-prize fighting laws, there was no law in the books about showing prize fighting films. So just three days after the Colbert Fitzsimmons fight, the Maine legislature passed a law fining anyone who exhibited boxing films a sum of $500. But the popularity of boxing was already too strong, and these laws were mostly ignored and largely forgotten. In 1907, Chicago, the second biggest film market at the time, gave the chief of police the power to issue and deny permits for movie exhibition based on moral grounds, making it one of the first municipalities to begin exercising censorship over movie content. The following year in New York City, the biggest film market at the time, Mayor George B. McClellan issued a decree on Christmas Eve 1908 that revoked the licenses of all theaters, shutting down over 550 establishments based on fire safety and moral grounds. Uh, movies were being hit where it hurt in the box office. Uh, something had to be done. The People's Institute, one of the few reform groups that didn't see movies as evil, offered up a solution. They brought together 10 other reform groups, including the Federation of Churches, the Women's Municipal League, and the Society for the Prevention of Crime to create a new organization called the New York Board of Motion Picture Censorship. This panel of community groups would review films and recommend cuts for a small fee. Now, since the New York film market was so big, the board's influence began to take a nationwide impact, and the name changed to the National Review Board. Now, for a few years, this board was able to ward off calls for government censorship. But the tide for government intervention was strong, with many states enacting their very own censorship boards. And then came the landmark decision of Mutual Film Corporation v. Ohio Industrial Commission in 1915. Mutual was a newsreel corporation that objected to having to pay fees to various state censorship boards and then wait weeks or months before their newsreels were approved. They filed on First Amendment grounds, but the Supreme Court didn't buy it and declared that, quote, the exhibition of moving pictures is a business, pure and simple, originated and conducted for profit, not to be regarded as part of the press of a country or as organs of public opinion. With that 1915 decision, the movies were not legally considered free speech, thus handing the government the legal reign to implement laws over the content of film. The powder keg of censorship was set. All was needed was a spark, and it would come in the form of scandal. The early 20s were rocked by Hollywood celebrity scandals. From Fatty Arbuckle's unsubstantiated charge of rape and manslaughter, William Desmond Taylor's murder with homosexual undertones, and Wallace Reed's drug overdose, the yellow journalism tabloids hungrily fed at what looked to be a bloated corpse of spoiled Hollywood excess. Pressure was mounting for someone to clean up Hollywood, with over 100 congressional bills for censorship to protect the common good being submitted in 1921. 
But censorship from Washington was the last thing Hollywood wanted. So Hollywood studios came together in 1922 to form an association called the Motion Pictures Producers and Distributors of America, the MPPDA. In a move that mimicked the actions of Major League Baseball after the 1919 World Series gambling scandal, the MPPDA reached out to a Washington insider, William H. Hayes, Postmaster General under Warren Harding and former head of the Republican National Committee. Paid a handsome sum of $150,000 a year, Hayes' task was really just PR, to relieve the pressure between Hollywood and Washington and lobby for the interests of the studios. In 1927, Hayes formed a committee of studio heads to create a list of don'ts and be carefuls, based on lists of items that were commonly rejected by local censorship boards. These included 11 subjects that were to be totally taboo, and 25 that had to be handled very delicately. But this list was short-lived, as it didn't have any real teeth. The issue of censorship in Hollywood raged on, but now was fueled by a brand new movie technology, sound. Sound in motion pictures attracted new audiences, including young children. A sound also ushered in a cycle of grim, violent realism that sparked yet another outcry from an increasingly vocal public. On March 31st, 1930, the MPPDA issued a statement of policy called the Motion Pictures Production Code, also known as the Hayes Code. It set up a small jury to review films for content. Understaffed and headed by ineffectual but mostly uninterested board members, the Hayes Code was still without teeth and largely mocked by industry insiders. Well, that changed when the American bishops of the Roman Catholic Church organized the Legion of Decency, and in 1934, with the support of Protestant and Jewish organizations, began calling for boycotts of the films they deemed as unacceptable. Well, this was the dollar that broke the camel's back. The Hollywood studios still reeling from losses in 1933, due in large part to the delayed effects of the Great Depression, were forced to act. The Hayes office authorized the setup of the Production Code Administration, the PCA, with Catholic layman Joseph I. Breen as its head. The MPPDA agreed to show only films that carried the PCA seal of approval, and the studios voluntarily gave the PCA the authority to review and delete morally objectionable content both in the final script and in the final cut of the film. A Breen enforced this code zealously. Forbidden were scenes of passion. Films had to uphold the sanctity of marriage. Adultery, seduction, and rape were never to be more than suggested, and only if absolutely necessary to the plot and always punished at the end. Profanity, racial epithets, implications of prostitution, drug addiction, nudity, sexually suggestive dancing, and costumes were all verboten. The code also addressed violence. It was forbidden to go into details of a crime, display machine guns or illegal weapons, or even discuss weapons on screen. Law enforcement was never to be shown dying at the hands of a criminal, and all crime had to be punished at the end. This rigid, Catholic-inspired sensibility of good versus evil was a far cry from the loose morals of the Anything Goes jazz era. So why did studios agree to such draconian self-censorship? Well, there are several reasons. It kept Washington from exercising even more control over the studios. It quelled fears from religious groups threatening to boycott during these economically unstable times. And lastly, perhaps most cynically, the production code was a sort of blueprint for screenwriters. Stories could move in only one direction. Love ended in marriage. Crime ended in punishment. A simple, efficient method for studio systems to streamline the story process and mass produce as many movies as possible. By the 1940s, the production code would see some challengers, first in the eccentric Hollywood mogul, Howard Hughes. Uh, Hughes discovered the voluptuous Jane Russell and gave her her first role in 1941's The Outlaw. Hughes was in love with Russell's breasts, and who wouldn't be? Well, not the Breen office, which requested 37 specific reshoots objecting to the emphasis on Jane Russell's bosoms. 
of further troubles with state censorship boards forced Hughes to shelve the outlaw until the film got a limited distribution in 1943. Mired again in battles over censorship, Hughes shelved the project for another few years until he finally got a distribution deal in 1946 with a non-MPAA signatory United Artists. Now this started a legal firestorm with the MPAA. Despite or perhaps because of these court battles, United Artists roadshowed the outlaw to bountiful profits everywhere it went. The power of the code began to crack as the studio system fell out of power in the 1950s. Once studios were no longer permitted to own their own theaters, according to the Supreme Court, movie theaters were freer to show whatever they wanted, and sometimes they showed unapproved foreign films. While well, this led to the 1952 case Joseph Burstein v. Wilson, dubbed the Miracle Decision, referring to the Italian Roberto Rossellini short film entitled The Miracle, the Supreme Court reversed its earlier stance, ruling that expression by means of motion pictures is included in the free speech and free press guarantee of the First and Fourteenth Amendments. Though it would take another decade for the production code to completely erode away, the threat of government intervention was now gone. So now as the dollar had forced the studio's hand into the strict binds of the production code, it was the dollar that would make them free again. In 1953, Otto Preminger openly defied the PCA by releasing The Moon is Blue, a romantic comedy in which the Breen office objected to as having, quote, an unacceptably light attitude towards seduction, illicit sex, chastity, and virginity. That should be a quote on the poster. The film went on to be a hit without the PCA seal of approval. Preminger openly defied the PCA again in 1955's Man with the Golden Arm, starring Frank Sinatra playing a heroin addict. Another hit. Then Elian Kazan's Baby Doll, released by Warner Brothers in 1956, went on without a seal of approval and was openly condemned by the League of Decency. It also went on to be a success. By the 1960s, it was a free-for-all, with films like the British made blow up, with nudity becoming a box office smash. The cat was out of the bag, and the MPAA began looking to scrap the code in favor of a classification system. In 1968, the MPAA chairman Jack Valenti instituted a voluntary rating system with four levels. G for general audiences, M for mature audiences, R for restricted, no one under 16 without an accompanying adult, and X for adults only. A confusion over the M rating changed that rating to GP for general audiences with parental guidance and then flipped over to our familiar PG. PG-13 was added in the mid-80s as a midpoint between PG and R after some outcry over Steven Spielberg films like Indiana Jones and Temple of Doom, Poltergeist, and Gremlins all receiving PG ratings despite the amount of gore and unsettling images. Red Dawn would hold the honor as the first PG-13 film ever released. The adults-only rating of X was never trademarked by the MPAA. Filmmakers could self-classify their films under the X rating. This became a problem as the videotape pornography market exploded in the 1980s, exploiting the X rating with the logic that if one X was hot, then triple X must be really steamy. In September of 1990, the MPAA replaced X with NC-17. The movie rating system today is not without controversy. There's much secrecy and arbitrariness surrounding what separates a film from one rating to another. And there exists a silent economic censorship in place as many outlets and retailers refuse to carry NC-17 titles. But the internet, the brightest or perhaps filthiest bastion of free speech, is very much changing how films can be distributed and what kind of content is available. The goal of the rating system is to inform parents of the content of a film. Well, now more than ever, that information is readily available and even more specific than any rating systems could ever accomplish. Now, some may say that films were sexier or scarier under the censorship of the production code, for there's nothing that can be seen that is as tantalizing or as horrifying as what the imagination and anticipation can conjure. Now, there may be some truth in that, but given the choice between freedom and censorship, freedom is the only sustainable option. 
Now go out there, exercise that right to free expression and make something great. I'm John Hess and I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com. <laughs>